Good morning, church. So good to have you back with us for another online church service, especially if you're visiting. We're glad you're here. I pray you've had a blessed week and helped others so that they've had a blessed week. Or as I say, I pray you made it through another one of our Looney Tune type level chaotic, crazy weeks. In considering the times that we're in uh, this morning, and I'm going to warn our trilakes folks, especially to brace yourselves. I'm I'm going to try to start a three-week series. Uh, just the word series, you know, I I don't do many in form of series here because of certain personal things, but I'm going to try that this week. So brace yourself and know I don't need my temperature checked. Uh, we're just going to do that leading up to Christmas. I've got kind of my Christmassy, I don't know if you can see, tie, but uh, that's what we're going to attempt to do. And if you remember from last week, this when we started, uh, it's praying for open eyes. And the challenge was given that we would grow in our understanding of making sure we continuously could see what God wants us to see when we look around at our lives and not by the lie that Satan wants us to see. With everything being dark and hopeless to so many, we're never to uh, convince ourselves that that is truth. We're to convince ourselves, if we could open our spiritual eyes, that we would see that God is there and he's always been there. We talked about Elisha and his servant and the army surrounded the city of Dothan and they were going to take Elisha and his servant got up and saw this incredible army and came back to Elisha and said, oh, master, what are we going to do? And and all Elisha did was say, Lord, uh, I want to open his eyes. And we're praying for open eyes this morning to pray that prayer uh, as it applies to each of us. And especially those that are experiencing different storms of life that we pray, oh Lord, open his eyes and open their eyes. This morning I've come with a prayer and a challenge uh, that God will open our eyes to see an even more important area when it comes to seeing what God wants us to see. And this area is the area of truth. In the song we sing, we, we think, uh, I want you to think of these words that uh, are so powerful. Light of the world, you step down into the darkness. Open my eyes and let me see. Let that just sink in for a moment. And let's just put it in park and do a little digging and, and deeper thought about what took place. We get it from God's story as sin entered into the world through Adam and Eve in the garden, ruining that relationship. We find God at work. And He's working out His plan to redeem all mankind and all of his creation, we, we find in his story how he chose Israel, this small nation out of all the nations, to be his exclusive people. And he'd rescued them from Egypt and he was delivering them to a promised land. Now on the way, they experienced a little trouble. And as we say, well, are there people involved? Well, then there will be problems there will be problems, and people challenge God's choice of leadership through Moses, and as the story reveals, lots of people died. And then they doubted God's promise when they got to the border of the promised land and sent the spies over, and they came back and gave a report, and the people doubted, and the result of that was 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And the story reveals that lots more people died. And God put the sacrificial system in place where he required animal sacrifices. As we talked a couple of weeks ago, the, the lifeblood of an animal is required to, to pay that price or to make it possible for people to be in a relationship with God. And through that process and through the story, we find that a lot more people died. And then we get to Galatians chapter 4. And Galatians chapter 4 tells us that when the fullness of time came, that God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Here's your homework assignment right off the bat. I know, what was the fullness of time? Think about that and, and do a little research and, and we'll dig a little deeper coming in, Lord willing, next week into that topic. Today, I want to focus on just one thing, light of the world. 
you step down into darkness. Open my eyes and you let me see. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what that must have been like, how you envisioned it with Jesus sitting at the right hand of God in heaven in the throne room, if you will, and, and God looks to Jesus and says, it's time. And Jesus stands up and makes his way out of heaven and comes and he steps down into darkness. Hmm. And specifically, the thought of, of all of that I want to focus on is the opened my eyes part. For time's sake, we're going to just cut right to the chase this morning. If you get your Bibles open, let's find out uh, in John chapter 9. Uh, we get this incredible story. Jesus is walking along with the disciples in John chapter 9 and verse 1. And it says, as they went along, they saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, said, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Interesting start to the story for this morning's message. You see, we've been talking about why do bad things happen to good people. We need to understand from the context, 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 as Scripture reveals God's people in the day of Jesus, what they believed about that situation, they believed this, bad things happen to bad people. As is evidenced here, was it, was it him or was it his parents that messed up? Jesus is going to correct their thinking. He's going to say neither. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but it happened so the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it's day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. And then notice verse 5, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. We drop down and, and we find that Jesus is going to heal this man. He's going to restore his sight, going to spit in some mud and put it on his eyes. And, and then it ends up down in verse 13 that they brought this man to the Pharisees because there was a problem. You see, Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes on the Sabbath. That's a violation. So they brought the man in, in before them, the, the Pharisees. And in verse 16, some of the Pharisees says, This man's not from God, Jesus, for he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others asked, Well, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? Great question. It also reveals that not all Pharisees were bad. There were good Pharisees as well. And then you drop down and they want to ask the blind man all the questions. How did he do it? What did he do? And it ends up the blind man, I believe, is getting a little frustrated after restoring his sight. Because they actually call in his parents to say, let's prove that he was actually blind. And the parents come in and say, uh, yes, he's our son. And was he blind from birth? Well, yes, he was blind. Well, then how do you explain this? And they say, well, he's of age. You need to ask him. Why? Because in verse 22, it says they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. They'd be kicked out of church, is how we would word that today. So they brought the man back in a second time. They said, listen, you need to knock this off. This Jesus, we know this man's a sinner. And, and the, the man says, well, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know is I was blind, but now I see. So they answered, they talked more about him and, and, and said, well, then how do you explain this? And, 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 and he answered them in verse 27, I've told you what, what he did. And you didn't listen. See, what do you want to hear it again? You want to become his disciples too? That wasn't a good thing to say. It was a good thing, but not for the consequences. They, they hurled insults at him and said, listen, you're this fellow's disciple. We're disciples of Moses. And the man says, you know, that's remarkable, verse 30. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. No one's ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And to this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus, verse 35, is going to track this man down that he had restored his sight to. And he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man replied, well, who is he, sir? Tell me so I can believe. And verse 37, Jesus says, you've now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. 
And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And now here's where we want to really focus this morning. In verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I've come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. <laughs> Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this, and they asked, What? Are we blind too? And Jesus says, If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you see, your guilt remains. Mm. Light of the world, as we sing. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. You open my eyes and you let me see. What was the fullness of time? Why did Jesus step down into the darkness? Well, as John reveals, judgment. Jesus came into this world so that the blind will see. And then that very confusing to many saying, he says, the, the blind will see and those who see will become blind. And we can say, and all of God's people say, amen, except for the some that are saying, well, what are you saying, we're blind? Well, Jesus would say, yes. Not physically, but spiritually. What God wants you to see, the truth, you're not seeing. You're in complete darkness. And we asked this morning, how could they have missed this truth? This Messiah right in front of them, truth right in front of them, the light of the world right in front of them, and they remained blind and in the darkness. John had a whole lot to say about the light of the world stepping down into the darkness. In John 1 verse 5, we're told the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. And we can ask, well, why? Why? Well, let's stay in the Scriptures. God's going to answer that. In John 3 and verse 19, here's our answer. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. So let's make sure we all understand before we go any further. It's certainly not the light, uh, that the light wasn't there so the people could see it. It's just that the people chose and they loved the darkness. They loved the darkness more than the light. How crazy is that? I mean, how unbelievable is it? How could people be that blind, might say? Right, careful, and I'm going to say careful. You all know there's a so what that's coming here in a little bit. I wonder just how many opportunities these people in the darkness that we read about in the Bible, I wonder how many opportunities they had to see the light and they refused. I don't believe the darkness just suddenly came in and they were completely blind to the truth. I believe it was a slow process where the light would get darker and darker and darker until they were in complete darkness. And completely blind. More from John. In, in John chapter 8 and in verse 36 and following, Jesus is trying to get the Jews to see who he really is. He tells them, if you'll just believe my teachings, you will see the truth and the truth will set you free. No more blindness. And you remember the Jews answered, you're saying we're slaves? We're not slaves. We're Abraham's descendants. We're not slaves to anyone. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave, a slave to sin. And Jesus says, yes, I realize that you're descendants of Abraham, and yet some of you are trying to kill me because there's no room in your heart for my word. There's no room in your heart for my message. There's no vacancy when it comes to to truth. Your minds are made up. You love the darkness instead of the light. But I'm going to say in that scripture, though, hold up a second. It says they were trying to kill Jesus? God's people? The ones who, who knew the book forward and backward, all of scripture there, and they're trying to kill the light of the world? It seems pretty dark. How in the world could they not see the truth right before their eyes? Could it be that the prophecy was true? That Weston, adorable Weston, he told us about in the scripture reading from Matthew chapter 13 that though seeing they don't see, 
that their hearts are calloused, that they've closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would open their eyes and they could see and they would turn and God would heal them. The prophet knew that hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus would come and experience it. Could they be so blinded in darkness that they could kill the light of the world? And the answer we know is, oh yes, and then some. They would have the light of the world killed. We know that from scriptures. Well, now what? Well, no light, only darkness. They killed the king. Well, what happens with no king? We know from scripture, history repeats itself over and over again because darkness has been since the fall in the garden. We've had darkness. Well, what happens? Remember Judges 21, 25. And in those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Whatever they decided, whatever they thought. Here's our so what this morning. It comes down to me and you. What about us when it comes to what Jesus said about coming into our world so that the blind will see and that those who see will become blind? Which one are you? Which one am I? Or as I apply it to myself, I have to ask from our, our title this morning, is it getting dark in here or is it just me? Do I have room in my heart for truth? Am I able to, to, to listen and to submit to, to the authority of God, to the Holy Spirit, through His Word when it comes to shining light, perhaps in an area of my life that might be a little dark? Am I staying away from the darkness Am I seeing what God wants me to see when it comes to, to the decisions that I make or the actions that I take or the thoughts that I think? Could I ever get so blind that I would want to kill the light of the world? The people that stood there in front of Jesus that were trying to kill him are God's people. Could I ever get that blind? How could that happen? That's part of our so what this morning and our homework for you to take home and debate and to discuss or to contemplate if you're by yourself. To How could that possibly happen? God's people, again, who know their scriptures, and yet the light of the world stands before them and they kill him. Same folks will be involved with killing another light in the world. It's the guy named Stephen. Uh, we've talked about him in the past. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, we get his credentials, if you will. He was a man full of God's grace and power. He did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. But the scriptures say that some folks got mad. Imagine that. Are there people involved? They stirred up the crowd, these, this, this group of folks who were upset, and they found some folks that would lie about Stephen. They would lie, and what they would say was, hey, this man Stephen, he's speaking against Moses and the law, and it ends up going to the court of the Sanhedrin. And in Acts chapter 6 and verse 15, it says that all that were sitting in the Sanhedrin saw that Stephen's face was like the face of an angel. Would that have any impact? We've talked about this prior. Hey, truth is sitting right in front of them, right in front of their eyes. Could they see it? And the answer is no. They could see Stephen's face, but they couldn't see the truth. Stephen's going to present that truth, and, and their response is pretty disturbing. They're going to become furious. Well, how furious? It says they gnashed their teeth at him. That sounds pretty furious. In fact, if you do the literal translation of that word nas, you'll find it, it results in a biting and the ripping of flesh. They gnashed their teeth at him. And it gives light to the, the phrase and truth to it blind with rage, perhaps. 
And then we find as they were taking Stephen out and, and with this furious and this gnashing of teeth that Stephen is going to, he's full of the Holy Spirit, he's going to look up to heaven and he gonna, he's going to see the glory of God and he's going to see the Son of Man, he's going to see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And as this crowd is coming in around him, gnashing their teeth, Stephen says, look, I see heaven open. And I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And the Bible says they covered their ears and they rushed him and they dragged him outside the city gates and they stoned him to death. Question. In fact, this is one we had our, our Wednesday night gathering from the folks that normally meet here at the building and that was changed to, to go to Zoom. So we were online with the group. It was awesome because we got to see Homer Montgomery who had been a member here for, for a long time and had moved to Florida and he showed up in that Zoom meeting. I thought, man, the blessing of technology. But, but in that, they also kind of tore up my sermon for today because they were talking about things from last week's sermon and they already, put the pieces of the puzzle together and says, and by the way, like, like uh, that Balaam and his donkey that Balaam couldn't see had sin in his life. He was blinded by that. I said, yeah, you, you got it. That's part of the, the message. And then even into the text this morning. But I asked him that qu a question concerning the well uh, that Hagar, when God opened her eyes that she could see the well of water. And I'm going to ask for this message today about what Stephen saw. And had that crowd listened, and if they would have looked up, what would they have seen? Is it possible that they would have seen the heavens opened and the glory of God and Jesus standing at his right side? But there was not a chance of them to see that. Why? Because they were enraged. They were blinded by rage. They were gnashing their teeth and would not be able to see it. So let's finish our so what with this question from this story. How many teeth gnashing moments have you had in your life? And I'm not talking about just today. I'm talking think back and, and put, some, put some history together. How many teeth gnashing moments have you had? Are you blind with anger? Have you ever been that mad that you were blind with anger and you did something or you said something that you regretted later? Maybe it was this last week or the week before Thanksgiving. Sitting around a, a, a table with Thanksgiving, yeah, it's a prime opportunity for families to, to get into those forbidden conversations, to, to bring up something about politics or the virus and mask or, or football, whatever it might be, and a disagreement can come into play. Are there people involved? Maybe you've been involved with one of those and the anger came out and maybe you're not even speaking to some of your family members right now. I don't know, but I do know people a little bit because I'm one of them. How many teeth gnashing moments have you had in your life? I confess, I've had quite a few. And through it all, in the heat of the moment, I'm telling you, you could stand the light of the world right in front of me and tell me, Greg, knock it off, and I wouldn't see it. And I wouldn't notice that it was me being covered up with the darkness of my wrong thinking or wrong behavior. In fact, I would take offense at anyone that would even bring up part of a topic that I would interpret. Oh, you're, you're saying that I'm this or you're saying that I'm this? Uh, when things aren't all locked down, I do a, a substantial amount of PA announcing and and many times, depending on the event of where I'm at, if it's at a high school or over at the Air Force Academy in one of their events, I, I will get one page of rosters and lineups and then about 25 pages of, of sportsmanship warnings. And in, in those events, usually at state championships and things with basketball, I'll, I'll have to read through it every moment I can, some warning to say to the fans, please, sportsmanship so important. How do you want to be remembered? These athletes have worked so hard. Don't disrespect their performances. And they say, well, why all the sportsmanship warnings? Well, are there people involved? Then there will be problems. And what I've come to learn and experience, it doesn't matter how many warnings are given. 
But I, I will say this, as I started when this whole crisis began, I said, hey, listen, when the smoke clears, there was a sermon months ago and different things. And then I brought it out. I said, crisis doesn't produce character. Crisis reveals character. It reveals how people are going to respond when pressed. It reveals when, how people are going to respond when challenged. And now I've come and I said, you know what, as I think about it, Athletic events do the same thing. They don't really produce character, but boy, they reveal character. Some of the nicest folks you'll ever meet, uh, you put them in the stands at a, at a sporting event, and things get absolutely terrifying if you're there and watching. Screams of boo, boo, or you stink, ref, or that's a terrible call, that's a horrible call. You're, what, are you blind? Uh-huh. And then on Sunday, many of those same folks will sit in the pews and sing, Amazing Grace. <laughs> it's the closest thing, as I've announced that so many of those and have had to have called for security sometimes to put them and get that fan out of the event, that it's one of the closest things to actual gnashing of teeth, I believe you can witness. Scary. It's also why 80% of all high school officials quit in their second year. They don't ever see a third. They say it's just too terrifying uh, to even explain how, what, what happens at these events while we're trying to officiate. And you know, as I think about it, sporting events may not be the closest thing to actual gnashing of teeth that we can witness. I know of many churches right now all across the land that are experiencing lots of folks with gnashing of teeth moments. And it's understandable. I mean, this pandemic can easily bring out the worst in us. It does me. I can be so frustrated, so angry of what happened to all the fun stuff that we used to do, especially as a church. I hate it. And I confess there are many, many times I want to gnash my teeth at people making the decisions regarding this crisis from, from a, if it's a governor or a health official or a fast food manager or the elders of the church, whoever it might be. I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I want to stand and shout, boo, boo, that's a terrible call. You stink. Are you blind? How could you make that call? You're so wrong. And this message today is to help remind me that the light of the world is still in our world today. It's in me. And it's in you. And it's in all of God's people who believe we are to shine our lights of hope into the darkness. We must be the ones that see, not the ones that see and have become blind with sin. When everyone else around us is blind, we're the ones who are to help them to see. I've been thinking a lot lately about what churches would be like if God was putting us through 40 years of discipline, just like he did in his past history, to all the people because they had fallen into the darkness. They'd become blind, not physically. 40 years. What would there be left in our lives today as a church if we were going to be like they were 40 years. Here's the good news. I've shared it with you before. It's changed a little bit. We've been through 267 days so far. Only 14,333 days left. Let's just keep marching. Hmm. That's why I pray for open eyes for all people, especially myself. Because it is so easy, so easy to step into the darkness. I will not stand and shout and gnash my teeth during this crisis, even though every part of me wants to. I will stay in God's word and I will do what it says. From Romans 13, I will submit to the governing authorities, even though every part of me would rather cuss and scream and fight and shout, for there is no authority, God tells me, except which, that which God has established. I'm going to do what God commands me to do and, and let my light shine at the drive-through 
for the food I'm picking up, when they completely messed my order up for the 666th time, even though I'd much rather gnash my teeth at them, I will bear with them, Colossians 3.13, and I will forgive them all grievances, and I've been forgiven them a lot. I mean, how difficult is it? I said no onions. How difficult, but I, I will forgive, and not only that, but I'm going to forgive like God forgives me. I'm not going to hold it against them. And I'm going to do what God commands me to do when it comes to my elders who are mere men trying to make the best decision for the flock that, the, that God is holding them directly accountable for. I'm going to give them, 1 Timothy 5, 17, double honor, which can actually be interpreted as they need to be paid. And to that I would say, let's start with single honor right now. We'll work our way up, but... I'm not going to stand on the sideline and boo and criticize them and say, that's a terrible call. You stink. You're horrible. Are you blind? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let my light shine. And I'm going to love each and every one of you through the darkness because we will make it through the darkness, not because of how good we are, but because of how good our God is. United by the Holy Spirit and eagerly anticipating the return of our King. And I will continue to sing with all I'm worth. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Why? Because I once was blind. But now, now I see. Praise be to God. May God bless us all to have open eyes to His truth continuously, so that it will never get dark in here. Until next time, keep the faith.